audience to start thinking about any questions that you'd like to ask that we haven't covered. And see, I see a hand up already. <laughs> so, Dick. Sorry, the, how many come from PR and how many come from in-house? Stories are sourced. I can give a shot. Uh, I honestly, off the top of my head, have no idea what like, the percentage breakdown is. Do you mean in terms of coming from an in-house like press person versus an uh, outside PR agency? Or I do a lot of just hunting around for cool stuff. I mean, I watch Twitter all day. Um, if there's a cool startup, I see like a link. I will follow that, and I think it's cool. I will write it up right that second. Um, but I, I think, you know, it's really hard to ensure that I'm going to see that tweet. So the most consistent way to do it is like emailing us, you know, a tip, or a, we've got a tips line that goes every single writer at TechCrunch. Just tips at TechCrunch. Um, so I think that's probably where the vast majority of the st of the stories come from. But some of the diamonds in the rough, I guess you could say, are are ones I find in forums about startups. Like Hacker News is great, um, or or Twitter. So I, I don't know the breakdown. Sorry about that. I don't know. <clears throat> it is a really difficult question to answer. I mean, a, a lot of my um, writing is driven by news. It's just ha you know, if Hewlett Packard happens to uh, you know dispose of its CEO, I'm going to write about that that week. So that's that's news driven, and and then there are ideas driven pieces, trend pieces, theme pieces that we want to pick up on. But I would say you know. Even within those pieces, I will reach out sometimes to companies that I think are of interest, or PR people will have communicated some things that are going on that I'll say, that's really interesting, I've got to put that away, and when I come to this trend, I'm going to pull that back out. And then obviously I do watch Twitter and uh, TechCrunch and uh, lots of other things to see what's of resonance there. And so it's like a secondary impact of whatever the PR activity has been that's resonating on a TechCrunch. Sorry, I can't give you a percentages. Uh, one thing I did want to relate is I think it's uh, actually relatively important and actually easier than you think to build a relationship with press and bloggers. And um, I guess, you know, starting five, six years ago, like, Mike was a little bit more, Mike Arrington was a little bit more approachable when he lived in a house that was actually right down the road and you could go hang out in his, uh, you know, barbecue or party or whatever in the afternoon. But uh, surprisingly, I think for the TechCrunch uh, crowd or other tech press, you can build a relationship, especially if you live in Silicon Valley and, you know, are willing to approach them over time. And I feel like many people just don't make that investment and it's, it's fairly s straightforward. Um, uh, another question? Yes. What you say? Yes. Yeah, like, well, I mean, I don't know. I just think it's like most people don't reach out enough to them, engage in the comments, engage on your blog, you know, read their own personal stuff, find out what they like. Uh, I don't. Th I don't think most people like read, you know, what the reporter or blogger has written in the last like week or two. Or, or even worse, they'll come to the reporter and say, "Hey, someone just wrote a story about us about this. Wouldn't you like to write about us?" And like that's the last thing. <laughs> But I mean, a classic mistake is understanding, like, if someone's just written about you on a topic, it's very unlikely that the next reporter wants to write about that same topic, unless they're just a clueless outlet that's just going to, like, release the same, same thing. Yeah, well, and, that, and that's true. That does have value. <laughs> uh, Danielle? Uh, So how do you reach out to initial journalists and is a cold call or a cold email okay? Sure. So people do it all the time. So it's totally fine to directly reach out to us. Uh, I think the most efficient way, at least the way we're set up, is every writer gets an email that's sent to tips or our company submission form. That said, if you've identified that you know one of these writers uh, has focused in this category before, feel free to reach out to them directly. If you don't hear back in a couple of days, uh, you know, Try, try the general line. In general, getting that initial contact is, is hard because there's a flood of email coming in at all times. Um, and the trick is persistence is key. 
you can't try once and it didn't work, so you're going to give up. But you can't get annoying because then we'll never respond. And it's not, it's not even a conscious decision. I don't go, oh, this person has emailed me three times in the last three days. I'm not going to reply. It's just like you just kind of mentally stop seeing the, that email come in. So, and this is really hard for me to give a rule, but I think trying twice within a, a two to three day span is good. And if you don't hear back, maybe try again a week or two later. Uh, I don't know if you guys agree with that, but yeah, getting that first reply is difficult. And coming to events like this is a great way to get that, you know, well, it is. Uh, it's all right, I'm used to it. One thing that you should never do is cold call someone. That will drive, like, you have awful timing no matter what time you call, just don't do it, so. Um, as we don't sign our articles, people will say, well, who the hell are you? Um, how do I find you? And actually, you know, you'd say, well, have you been on economist.com? There's a media directory there. It has all of our names, our beats, everything. Oh, really? Well, it's like 101. You should have gone to the website. Look on the, like I should have gone to your website before I even come and interview you, right? I should understand everything that's on there. You should do the same with me. Um, cold calling, difficult, yeah, really difficult because usually it's annoying. Um, I would say email is a far better way to approach and preferably you know, somebody, again, who's done all of the things that I said before. So it's not a, a spray and pray email. Another, another thing that I've done in the past that I've found very effective is be a resource or be a source for them. Uh, so inform them about an industry, inform them about a trend, be a source for other interesting news. So if you, if you always are coming to them with an interesting news angle or story, a lot of times they'll take your call when you're trying to pitch your own story as well. Uh, that may you know, take a little bit more creative approach to the game. Um, but usually if you're a notable and interesting source for news, they'll spend more time with you when that news is about your company as well. Uh, other questions? Yes? For, I was going to say that that's actually pretty high. If you're getting a if you're getting a story one out of every two meetings, that's that's awesome. <laughs> you want to come up on the panel? You can tell other people what you're doing in that meeting. <laughs> yeah. So. Right. So I, I think somebody brought this up before, and I'll just relate a personal story, which is uh, it's much easier to pitch a story in the trending area that the reporters want to write than a story about your company. And so try and think about your product releases and your company story in that trend. Uh, so classic example was uh, I was working at, we were working at Simply Hired. I was trying to figure out an angle to get into The Economist. And uh, housing maps, Paul Rademacher had just done housing maps, which is a mashup between uh, Craigslist and Google Maps. So basically, I pitched The Economist on housing maps and Paul Rademacher, who was a geek who wasn't looking for PR, and then pitched myself in the same story <laughs> in a trend about mashups, which actually got us in The Economist. And it was just like, it was a non-intuitive way to think about trying to get a story, which is pitch a trend and pitch another company as your way in the door, you know, and then figure out how you fit into that strategy but I, I think most people are like here's my story here's my news here's my press release you want to write about that right and it's like fuck you no I don't care about anything that's going on with your company I care about Groupon right or I care about flash sales or I care about you know the latest like social networking movie that just came out and so I think you know spending 80% of your focus around what's the current news coverage and trends and how do I fit my company and product into that story is a much more effective way to like then pitch any of these guys my opinion Hugo. This is PR or marketing overall? Okay, so I guess you, you're a one or two person startup, you're unfunded or very little funding, let's say you have less than 50,000 in the bank, 
who do you hire first and why if, uh, if you're trying to get outbound reach or coverage on marketing or PR? Uh, Vince or Stu? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd say hire one marketing person who's hungry enough to go out there and write the emails and go to the events and uh, get in front of tier one media who's able to blog for you, who's able to tweet, who's able to get the infrastructure set up for you so you can show some momentum. And then the second person I would hire, I would let that person do their job as a marketer and then I would hire somebody else who's um, either within the company or a really strong contractor, a small PR firm to run the PR aspect of it. Yeah, I think definitely the very first hire needs to be someone who's capable of writing content. Uh, you definitely need someone who can write um, your company blog content, your social media content, your your website content, uh, the pitch emails to the reporters. Um, you need you need someone that can can provide content and then disseminate it through social media. And after that, it's not a far cry to be able to pitch media. Uh, if you once you understand the business and you have writing skills and you've created some social media buzz. Then you need to start thinking about the things Dave just talked about as far as how do you fit your, your company or into the to larger space or trend. And I just wanted to go back and, and mention one thing about what Jason talked about, about building relationships with reporters. <clears throat> I think it's a great idea to get out of your office and come to conferences just like you would network in order to meet VCs or meet partners, but to meet the press. Because if you can actually put a physical face with a name, make eye contact, exchange cards, shake hands maybe even change phone numbers. It's just much, much harder to, reporters are super busy, and a lot of times things are coming at them, just like a type A personality who reads email, all you want to do is dispose of it. How do I dispose of it and move on to the next thing? And if you don't know who you are, and then someone, attack, someone approaches you, you just try to find a way to move on. And it's much harder to just cold dismiss someone if you've met them in person. and you might actually get your call answered because for some reason their phone comes, your name comes up because you got into their contact book because you changed cards. So take the time to meet people face to face and shake hands. It's just human nature. It's hard to reject someone you've met. So a great tip is meet the newest writer at the publication you're going after and treat them like a rock star. I've done that like multiple times, did that with Jason, did that with a bunch of other people. Like, uh, you know, and, and actually this is even more advanced is when they leave, take them someplace, you know, and like learn from that. I mean, it's just too many people go try approach Mike Arrington specifically, or, you know, the lead, is, the lead current lead reporter for the pub. And like, you know what? Most people don't remember who the byline is. And actually, it's almost nearly the same value as having the same brand at the top as it does having Mike Arrington's name. I hope Mike's not watching this. Um, so like, really, I, I do highly recommend, like, you know, you'll, the lowest person on the totem pole is going to have a lot more time for your story than the person who's writing the busy stories all day long. Uh, another one is just know the politics. Uh, so just... Very basic tip, don't try and pitch TechCrunch after you pitch Mashable or vice versa. They don't really like each other very much. Uh, so that's not two stories you're going to necessarily get from going after them at the equal same time. Um, maybe uh, one, or like one or two last questions, and then I'd like to get some do's and don'ts. Uh, Rich. Trade press, yeah. Right, right. So I guess you know we've got an example of sort of tech-focused press and sort of broad, you know, high-minded, you know, high-income press. <laughs> yes, well, no, not exactly, but. Um, so we, had, we don't necessarily have a representative, a targeted vertical, unless you consider tech that vertical. But any thoughts about whether you should spend more time with you know, industry-specific press or trade press? And how do you work that in versus others? Um, I don't know if you guys feel like that's a target or not. Yeah, we can. I mean, I think on, on a B2B um, aspect, you're, you're definitely right. I mean, there's still going to be thought leaders. There's still going to be experts. 
Um, I think you want to appeal to those people. Um, I think a lot of times it's, it's public events too, it's conferences, um, and then you, it's a smaller group of people, so you can more, more likely hit them um, at actually an event and, and identify who those kind of thought leaders are in the blogging space a lot, a lot quicker than you can with the B2C space. Um, so, you know, and then I think you kind of need to round, round the, the wagon a little bit. You need to understand who covers each aspect to that vertical. So, you know, with personal finance, we understood who covered investments and who covered money saving and who covered kind of general finance. And so, you know, we wanted to make sure we had friends in each of those different aspects. Um, and something I think we had covered before, I guess, you know, the question was, do you hire one person? I think the actual question is, you can hire a lot of people on a relatively small budget when content is the resource area. <laughs> um, I think people uh, think about just making one hire, and I think a strategy could be you hire five people on a very small budget for three months and expect that you'll fire three of those people within three months, and then you'll eventually pick one of those two in the next three to six months. Uh, and some of those people might be volunteers or college students who you're even not paying at all. You're giving them an internship opportunity. So I mean, content production, at least in the current environment, is not a cost-intensive one uh, for the moment. Uh, you may have, you know, more cost intensive, you know, for people that are extremely experienced, but at least with Mint er early, we hired a tier two personal finance blogger who was still in college for a couple thousand dollars a month. That person already had five to 10,000 followers. Uh, and that person was very effective in writing original content for us and also identifying, you know, who was the top, you know, bloggers in the field that we could actually reach. So I think piecework, but really with the intent to hire and just you know, know that you're going to have a high fail rate in going after people initially, but hire out of work writers and hire, you know, partially employed writers and hire college students and hire volunteers, so to speak. Uh, but do, you know, several of those at the same time with an explicit, you know, goal or target of a lot of production and a lot of high quality, you know, sort of hits and, and then, you know, you know, wean aggressively from that initial set of people that you're going after. Uh, any more questions? Ethan, you've had your head up, sorry, for a while. Okay, so how, you know, how do you make good news uh, last longer than the bad, than the last bad news? <laughs> it's hard, because yeah. people like bad news more than good news. Bad news sells. Social media really helps you with that. So one of the things is we see when, when press covers us and, you know, we, if we can anticipate it, even if we don't anticipate it, and then we'll go out and we'll, you know, actively try to, you know, tweet it out and push it out on Facebook and um, pass it around on social media and really try to get that secondary amplification effect. And sometimes what we see is we'll actually get more users and more coverage on the social media secondary effect than we did initially on that initial PR PR. Um, PR uh, lift that we got. So I'd say if you have a good social media team and you're good social media chops, then you'll be able to get a lot more mileage out of that. Okay, Martin. Yes, I mean, I think it's important to think about the different dimensions that that information could fulfill. For example, you know, someone might write about your company specifically, but not write about the trend that Dave was talking about earlier. And if I've seen the company covered, I'm not going to write about the company. But if you come to me and say, well, hang on, you know, I know that there's a piece about us a month ago, but they really missed this angle. And it's big, you know, it's a big trend and we're really doing well, but there are three or four others, perhaps in different parts of the world, who are doing this too. You know, that's a classic economist story. Are you going to write it? I'd say, well, oh, that's really interesting. Let me think about it. Yeah, Mar Martin's talking about uh, how do you take good news and, and make it last by repurposing the, the similar news for both your targeted publication, but also putting the unique twist on it or a new angle on it. And we're, or here, we're, I think we're talking mostly about social media, very, very tactically in the immediate term. I, I, when I first heard the question, I'm like, you really can't because the news cycle has shrunk so tightly that, I mean, news is dead in hours. And, but I do think that there are things you can do to try and prolong that buzz cycle for 24 to 48 hours at a minimum. And it's, it's primarily social media driven and it's playing the time zones, uh, you know, breaking things at night on the East Coast and letting them rebuzz in the morning on the West Coast. It's 
waiting until it starts to die and then re-putting it out via your blog or, or, or retweeting it out, trying to get the Twitter army to follow you, seeing if you can seed it with somebody who, who ranks well, and then, and then obviously you know, playing the tech meme game, trying to get it up and down, you know, up and down the page. I mean, there are a lot of things you can do on the social media side to really try to prolong that buzz for 24, 48 hours, which is probably not nearly as cerebral and as thoughtful, but short term equally important but long term i think the idea is how do you repurpose your content idea uh, to make it more palatable uh, to be reused by other publications so we didn't ask this question before so what's an embargo and should i give one uh, and how do you tie break or attempt to tie break between publications of equal interest uh, jason do you, do you are do you respect embargoes or not uh, as some of you are probably aware, TechCrunch. What is an embargo? An embargo, for those of you who don't know, is when you call up or you email in general uh, multiple reporters and you'll say, hey, we've got this story going out at 9 p.m. Monday night. Do you agree to the embargo? And if so, I'll send you the full story. Uh, if the, the reporters agree to the embargo, everyone in theory is going to wait till 9 p.m. and go out at the same time. Yeah, I'll get to that. Uh, the benefit to this system is that the reporter has more time to, to ask you questions and do their research and that sort of thing, and you get broad distribution at the same time. Uh, the problem with embargoes, and TechCrunch was not responsible for this problem. Uh, <laughs> okay. Before we stopped taking embargoes, they would break all the time. So, like, literally almost every embargo we'd get, I... And, I was often the one who was writing the story, and then it would get br broken, and then i tell Mike, and he'd yell at the PR person who was trying to coordinate this. At some other outlet, there would be an honest mistake where they went out three hours early because they thought it was Eastern time, not Pacific. And, right? yeah, it happens all the time. Reporters are apparently morons when it comes to figuring out time zones. So, yeah, f financial times is really bad, too. In, in Europe, they just have a, a really, like, financial times was, I, I, I would thought I would thought that like you know there are there have been around for a while but they couldn't handle it for now I'm bashing the Financial Times for no reason. <laughs> anyway, um, so we stopped taking embargoes. In in truth, okay. Stop interrupting me. This is a very complex answer. I got it. I have to I have to word it in a way that doesn't make me sound like a jerk. Um, and enables him to keep his job. <laughs> All right, so, so first off, one thing you can do, so back in, I think it was January 09 or so, uh, we announced that we're not honoring embargoes. No more embargoes. TechCrunch, no more right. embargoes ever. What this really was against yeah. are the, the, the blasted embargoes that PR people just send out without abandon. We have no idea what the t context is, how many people they're briefing. We have no relationship with this person. So the notion that we're going to accept this embargo with someone, we have no idea what's really going on, which is really where all the problems stem from because they were briefing 20 other outlets and of course someone's going to mess up. Uh, that's where it came from. If you were to email me tonight and you said, hey Jason, you know, we're trying to run an embargo story, we're working with X, Y, and Z press outlets, um, will you accept it? I'm probably going to say either yes and I'll, I'll stick to my word, or I'll say no, I'm not interested. Um, now, I can't say that's always going to be the case, but I can't remember the last time I've broken an embargo. So I just, I probably am just going to say no. That said, I would not advise just blasting out an embargo to release to us because then we may just go ahead with it. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's, I think that's pretty fair, even if other people will agree to that embargo that you blast out. Also, the other alternative is to give us some exclusive in which case, that has all the benefits of the embargo in that we have the time to research the story and talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and there's no issues with other outlets possibly messing that up. So. Isaac's uh, question. I just say to, to Isaac's question, Jason, how long do you think uh, a startup should wait to get a response back from you, whether if they have an exclusive? That's good. Uh, so what I would do, I think asking... I'd wait like two days, maybe, what? I'd wait two days, he's making faces. Is that, is this too long or not enough? Yeah, about two hours. Oh, two hours. <laughs> two hours. If you're being offered an exclusive. All right. 
Sin, I would send the exclusive email. If you don't hear anything back, well, see, the risk is that the reporter didn't even see it. So I'd send once. If you don't hear back in 12 hours, send another one. If you still don't hear back, maybe say, all right, I'm going with another outlet in case you, if you don't respond, in which case you'll often get a response immediately, um, which it's just luck of the draw, I guess. But PR stunts. Right. Uh, so I actually have done one of these. Actually, Kay was probably largely responsible for us doing Simply Fired way back in the day, which like tripled our traffic in three months. Uh, Ten national publications, and I don't know that there's any like magic to figuring out whether that's going to work or not. But like, uh. Kind of a long story, but um, so Simply Hired was the job-seeking search engine site. Simply Fired was this site that we created, like a uh, contest around people who would lost their jobs in tragic or funny uh, ways, uh, and it succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. Uh, Kay, I think, was the one who came up with the idea of like going after the guy who'd gotten fired from Google, Mark Jen, for blogging. Uh, but we also sort of loaded the deck with some other bloggers as judges. But uh, I don't know, just like. Never expected it to catch that much fire, but literally did it two or three different times and got massive amounts of traffic around it. Now, the question in my mind was always, did that traffic really convert to core use that we were actually thinking about? So the other thing about stunt PR, I would say, is it's great for getting your name in the press, but it may or may not always convert to target use for your site or your environment. Um, I think Mint's probably a classic example of pretty continuous, like, I wouldn't say stunt PR, but a lot of content-driven PR around the blog and around the infographic stuff. So I don't know if you guys want to comment on that at all. Like, do you think, Stu, do you think about like stunt-driven PR for for Mint? I mean, infographics are sort of stunt-driven PR in a way, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it is a little bit. I think you, you're trying to play off of an emerging trend, and you're trying to get attention and get a wider audience. And personal finance is just not something a lot of people cared about. Um, in, in kind of the general population, so we wanted to bring it to more of a, you know, broad appeal. And so I, I think if you do stump PR really well, then it works tremendous. And I think infographics are. Um, well, I tell you, the best stunt that we never originated, but that got covered by TechCrunch, <laughs> was when was when Intuit sent us a letter and challenged us that we didn't have a million users, and TechCrunch picked it up, and then Kevin Rose picked it up. Um, and it got you know 3,000 digs and was on revision three and these guys ran with it and then everybody else ran with it um, And it really is one of the things that prompted um, Intuit to start to consider to purchase man So but you know we didn't originate that but we just were the the beneficiary of that um, But so I think it's a really good stump PR. You don't na you don't naturally even have to Publicly disclose that it's a stunt so it just looks like a really slick marketing campaign. So I think infographics is something that it's not necessarily a stump, but it has great visual appeal and it brings a lot of people in the door and it has converted over time. The first one we put out didn't really convert. Um, but, you know, I, I think it is a bit of a stunt too. So, yeah, I, I'd say stump here. When done well, it's awesome. Usually it's miserable fail. Yeah. Vince, tell the story. You were telling the PayPal t-shirt about this. Um... So basically, this is more grill marketing than grill PR, but uh, back in 2001, uh, when, when Dave and I were at, uh, at, Pay Pay at PayPal, it was actually 2002, we were basically in a love-hate relationship with eBay. They had tried to acquire us five times over three years, and they always ended up paying you know, half our valuation. Always offering half. I'm sorry, my wife is nearby. Um, and so we were, we were getting kind of nervous that they were thinking that they were going to go ahead and launch a, a rival service that they would just dump. They would uh, not charge for it until they could dump and put us out of business and then, and then uh, relaunch. And so, uh, ironically, actually, it was my wife who said, uh, you know, they're having their very first eBay Live conference down in Anaheim, and uh, you guys need to be at that conference. And we're sort of like, well, it's, it's another company, it's their conference, it's their customers. She's like, well, they're also your customers, and you can't just let them take them, and you've got to go down there and stuff. I'm like, all right, all right. So if we put together this marketing team, we decided to go down there and have a party uh, the night before their conference for their best customers, who also were our best customers, because we shared overlap. Right. <laughs> right. And so, you know, as, as, as eBay's customers came out of their, came out of their dinner, 
already slightly tipsy, we kind of just very sh graciously showed them how they could just come next door to continue drinking on our dime. And uh, so while we were there, we also gave them all a PayPal T-shirt. And we said, tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow, when you go to eBay Live in their conference, wear this PayPal T-shirt. Because every hour on the hour, we will find someone on the conference floor wearing a PayPal T-shirt and give them $1,000. And so the next morning, eBay opened up the doors to their very first conference and in streamed thousands of people wearing PayPal t-shirts to their horror. Literally thousands. And, and they, were, they, were, they were mortified, horrified. And they kept trying to give people eBay t-shirts to put on. And they kept saying, this is my lottery ticket. <laughs> and so they never took them off for three days and that began to smell. But, yeah. Somebody's autographs. signing autographs for people wearing PayPal t-shirts, which, by the way, is currently framed in my home office. Um, but I guess that's an example of a guerrilla marketing stunt that also turned into a guerrilla PR stunt, but also actually, to be honest, that night was when they finally called for the fifth and last time and said, what's the price? L low probability effort, just occasionally, like you hit the fire on that one. Uh, one burning question, and then we'll uh, wrap up and go drinking. Uh, Danielle. So when, when do I try and seed that story? Oh, time of the week, you're saying. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's hard. Everyone wants to go at 9 AM Eastern time on Monday morning. If you're a startup, you do not want to go then. Um, <laughs> if I were a startup, I would reach out to press Wednesday afternoon, Thursday morning-ish, because the news cycle begins, it's definitely like, at its peak on Monday, and it sort of trails down over the course of the week. Uh, if you're a startup, you know any press from from any of these publications is great, no matter what time of the week it is. So it's more of a matter of getting coverage as opposed to, you know, like what time of the week you're getting coverage. Um, all, but there's one caveat to that: look at the calendar and see when the next Apple event is, because you do not want to be going the day of an Apple event, or like the day before, or even the day after, really. Google, I.O., any of that stuff. Okay, I, I think it just depends on you know, really understand the publication that you're targeting and really understand the websites because we all tend to have different kinds of cycles. Like if you call me on a Tuesday or Wednesday and say, I've got a pitch, I'm not going to listen to you because I'm right in my new cycle because I have to publish on a Wednesday or I send my stuff in on a Wednesday evening. If you hit me on a Thursday or a Friday, I'm far more likely to, to pay attention. Again, TechCrunch specific news tip. TechCrunch email summaries go out at around 8.45 to 9 a.m. So if you can time your publication for around 8 o'clock to 8.30, you'll be top of the list in that email newsletter summary that TechCrunch sends out. Uh, yes. That's a very specific, a very specific uh, one. Um, so uh, closing remarks, uh, your top do or don't for startups in terms of PR, one valuable nugget of wisdom that has never been ever released before. This isn't a nugget, or it's a big nugget, but it's not really anything we, we touched on. Uh, when it comes to actually crafting your pitch, uh, which is something that I'm sure some of you may have some problem with, especially if you don't have a PR firm. Do not look at a press release and think that you need to make your pitch look like a press release because I hate press releases. Um, I don't even look at the quotes in those because they weren't said by the, the people who they're attributed to. Um, you know, just kind of condense that down to a paragraph. Now, I don't need a long intro telling me how the, the state of whatever is changing and you're at the forefront of doing something. You know, just tell me what you are and, and what you're launching. Uh, and kind of related to that, don't be afraid of talking about your competition because a lot of pitches we get are sort of reinvent, reinventing the wheel where they're describing, you know, how a social network works when in reality you're, you're Facebook but with this sort of tweak or, you know, something like that. And also don't be afraid. A lot of times when I'm on a call with someone, I'll ask you, who is your competition? Because I've been doing this for like two and a half years now and I still don't know every single company that's out there. I may have forgotten them. And don't be afraid to say, you know, we do this, uh, but we do this differently. You know, it's always about how you're different, what you're doing better than your competition, not just the fact that they exist, because we're going to figure out that they exist. If we don't mention them, they're going to be the first comment on that article anyway. So just don't be afraid to talk about them, even in your pitch. Say, 
we're like these guys that you wrote about, but we do this better. Also, one more thing. Uh, this is one tip. No. Sorry. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think it's helpful. Um, if you see your competitor has just been written about, do not do a knee-jerk pitch like three hours later and say, hey, we do this too. Like, wait a week or two. You know, we're happy to write about that, but we don't like writing the same story twice. <laughs> My, my tip is fairly short and sweet, which is that, that as a person responding to the media or talking to the media, do not promise to do something and then not do it. Um, and that's primarily like a reporter calls you and they're asking for comment about a certain subject or they're asking about something you don't want to talk about and you basically say, okay, well, uh, I'll get back to you in an hour or I'll give you comment or I'll, I'll get the CEO to comment or I can't comment but we'll get something. If you've committed to doing something with the media, don't not do that, even if you didn't really want to in the first place, which this, the corollary to that is don't promise things you don't want to deliver or you can't deliver just to get off the phone. So I think that's kind of important. So I'd say give your PR slash social team ammunition. So either give them some you know, great infographic, a good video, um, a new product release to talk about, um, some new, some unique data that you can share. Give them some kind of ammunition that, that they can bring to the press. Or if you're the one actually going to the media, come with something specific that you can show them. Um, do show me that you've understood what The Economist is and what it's about and who its audience is. Uh, don't spray and pray. Uh, last one I would say is just like, don't be afraid to be yourself and go off message. I think it builds credibility with reporters over time. Um, so, admitting that you're not the best at something. <laughs> well, yes, Kay's had some experience with me going way off message. But I think, like, you know, this gets back to the building relationship with the press. Like, if you want stories on a regular basis, you have to take more risk. And this maybe isn't the story for Yelp or a larger name that already gets press inbound for what they want. But as a startup, I think you have to take risk. And, you know, building a relationship with them that's a little bit less you know, on message and less buttoned down is, you know, my preference.